Praise the Lord, saints. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I am honored to be joining you even virtually today at The Way, and I want to express my deep gratitude to my friend, my comrade, my brother, Pastor Michael McBride, for this invitation. I can't wait to be with you in person, to worship with you, and to be in your space again. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn with me. Turn with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 25th verse. If you have your Bibles, I really want you to look at the text. Starting at the 25th verse, I'll be reading from the New International Version, but whatever version you have is fine. This is what the text says. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the entire assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people, they are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of our God lasts forever. Pray with me, please. We give you thanks, O oh God, for life's journeys that have brought us all here to this virtual space today. We thank you for being an ever-present God, even when we are unable to see. We thank you for your grace when our fears interrupt our faith, Help us hear your word and to see your hand today and move with confident expectation toward our promised end. These things I ask in the matchless name of Jesus, amen. For the time that is mine with you this morning, I want to talk from the subject, do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? Beloved, it is no secret that 2021 is off to a roaring start. During an interview I did last week with Wisdom Elder Ruby Sales and Ferguson activist Brittany Packnett Cunningham, Brittany remarked, we hope to close the book on 2020 and prepare to begin again, but it feels more like 2021 just 2020 just turned 21, grew some bangs and came back bolder. And I could not agree more. We entered this year still reeling from the ravaging effects of COVID in our midst. Over 1.9 million people have died globally, and 350,000 of those deaths have been in the U.S. Because of inept federal leadership and a self-absorbed president, we are still experiencing record numbers of deaths daily, and yes, the vaccine has been released. While lesser equipped countries have successfully limited the virus in their midst without a vaccine, not only are we bearing the health challenges of COVID, although the stock market is booming, the reality is that most folk don't have enough stock to boom. And 153 million people who need help to survive this crisis have received a whopping $2,600 to supplement 11 months of financial shortfalls. That's about $236 a month if you do the math. Where does one live for that? How does one eat with that? 
In addition, there are 6.8 million more people unemployed today than we had just a year ago this time. Fortune magazine reported last week that 140,000 jobs were lost in December and all of them were lost by women. Our children can't go to school in ways that are best suited for their advancement. Many businesses are on the brink of closing and our hospitals are stressed to the max. Times are physically, mentally, and spiritually challenging. And if that was not enough, Last week, we watched white supremacists act a plum and deadly fool at the Capitol, acting out simply because from the White House to the outhouse, black freedom and self-determination remains inconceivable in the mind of whiteness. Media outlets were quick to declare, this is not America. To which I reply, exactly what part of this is not America? Is it the attempt to steal an election or the lack of militarization of police when it's white lives instead of black lives that they are confronting? Was it the Confederate flags or the dangling noose? Or was it all the guns when authority was clearly threatened and yet arrest was slow to occur? Reverend Starcy Wilskin reminded me last week of the words of Langston Hughes in his poem, Let America Be America. It was never America to me, Langston says. I am also mindful that this Martin Luther King Day weekend, I am recording and speaking to you in the city where Dr. King preached his last sermon, I've Been to the Mountaintop a sermon in which Dr. King surveys the historical landscape of this country through the lens of his mind and decides he is grateful to live in the 20th century, even if we were not yet the nation we were called to be. He speaks eerily, a prophetic word that seems to be a foretelling of his death. He said to the listening crowd in an impromptu sermon, I don't know what will happen now, We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter to me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. I'm also mindful that we have forgotten a lot about this Dr. King. We've forgotten about the Dr. King that arrived in Memphis in April. We've forgotten that his philosophies had matured and evolved. We had forgotten that he had moved from just a local concentration to a global concentration. We had forgotten his sermons about Vietnam and the insanity of black people and brown people going to fight wars that had nothing to do with us. We had forgotten his challenge about our economic power that even though we've been conditioned to think we don't have much, that collectively we are a force to be reckoned that can bring this country to its knees. We'd forgotten that he had moved to a place where we were no longer asking, but we were demanding what was due us. And by the time he reached Memphis, the Dr. King that we love and adore now was hated by most people, black and white alike. This is the role of a prophet, and it's undoubtedly true that Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the greatest prophets of the 20th century. This 13th chapter of, no of Numbers reveals a crucial element in the history of Israel, and I believe that it is relevant to us this morning in many ways because the challenges of the Israelites resemble the challenges we face today. This story recorded in the book of Numbers is the story of a burdened people accompanied by a bold God. God led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, guided them through the Red Sea, provided for them in the wilderness, and led them to the promised land. When they arrived at the borders of God's promise to them, Moses tells the people, now it is time for us to go in and take the land that God has given to us. So Moses sends in a search committee. Go and check out the land. Observe the people, their lifestyles, their cities, and their produce. 
Moses then tells them to come back and tell him what they find there. Now it's important to note that sending spies into Canaan is not God's idea. It was the people's idea recorded in Deuteronomy 1. God would have no need to send spies into Canaan to prove God's self because every word God speaks is true. So when Moses first tells the Israelites of the land God has promised, the people tell Moses that they will send men to scout it out. In our text, God has already told the Israelites what's in the land. God has already spoken to its abundance and to its richness. God has already spoken to its fruitfulness. And God has already told them that the land belongs to them. It is true that God did not tell them about the giants in the land. Because here's the thing. Giants to us are not giants to God. Yet we sometimes struggle, do we not, with just taking God at God's word. So Moses selects 12 men, one from each tribe, and the men take off and spend 40 days spying out the land. When they come back to give Moses this account, they tell him, we went to the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. And holding in their hand, they show him, here is the fruit. The spies came back holding huge clusters of grapes and pomegranates and figs in their hands. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and large, they said. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Have you noticed how often the word but is heard when it's time for the plans of God to advance in our lives? No matter what is suggested, there are almost always those who think it's too soon, too much, or too difficult to achieve. That is exactly what was happening here. Ten of the twelve spies, everyone except Joshua and Caleb, disqualified themselves from God's gift to them. Not because of God, but because they are not willing to risk failure even in the company of one who cannot fail. And so it is with us as well, my friends. Some of us are still shouting around the perimeter of God's promises on our lives because we don't really understand the sovereignty of the God that we are shouting about. Nor do we fully grasp God's love for us and our power and our strength and our ability, not because of ourselves, but because of our God. Sometimes, beloved. We miss out on all God has for us because we magnify the strength of our giants over and above the strength of our God. So the Bible says, Caleb intervenes. Caleb counters doubt and negativity with the promises of God. We should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it, Caleb says. And I cannot speak for you this morning, but I've lived long enough now to thank God for the Caleb's in my life. I am grateful for the small circle of friends I have who can see what I cannot see as it pertains to my own life. I'm grateful for the voices in my midst who challenge my fears with my faith. I'm grateful for my sisters who will not allow me to settle for less than all that God has promised. I am grateful for those who can still see God when giants are blocking my view. The Bible says most of the men who had gone with Caleb replied, we can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And so it is with life. There will always be those who doubt our abilities, our readiness, our strength to acquire all God has decreed. There will always be those who say you're not smart enough, you're not anointed enough, you are not gifted enough. But I pray that you will always have a few Caleb's in your midst. I pray that there will always be those in your life who will remind you that nothing is impossible with God. 
My prayer for you is that you will always have a few folk that challenge your fears and interrupt your insecurities and remind you that you have nothing to fear with God. And in this current day, beloved, when there are dangers seen and unseen, in this current day where our civil rights and human rights are being attacked left and right, in this day when 11 million children go to bed hungry every night, in this day, in this country, where 587 children separated from their families at our borders still have yet to be reunited with their families. In this day, when all the safety nets for the poor and the vulnerable and the sick and the elderly and the young are being systematically and systemically dismantled. In this day, when Christian theology is being blasphemy, blasphemously just opposed with white supremacy his ideology in this day when preachers are plentiful but prophets are few we need a few Caleb's in our midst we need to be reminded that our giants are not giants to the God that we serve I am not naive I understand that there are giants in the places God has promised we can go there have always been giants there will always be giants. There will always be people and circumstances that seek to block our path. There will always be those who want to break you, to discourage you from pressing your way. Friends, giants are a fact of life. But we need to understand that just because someone else is trying to block you, that does not mean that they can take your place. Just ask the senators who made history in Georgia. Our God is greater than any giant. When we walk in unbelief, it blinds us to God's greatness. God is able to do exceedingly. He is able to do abundantly more than we can even ask or imagine. God exceeds my asking. God exceeds my believing. The question is not how big is our giant. The question is how big is our God? And my Bible tells me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I ask you today, if it's not the giants that are stopping you, and if it's not our God that is stopping you, then what is stopping you from going after all God has for you? Maybe the obstacle standing in your way is not the enemy, but the inner me. The Israelites get to the crux of their problem, and I would suggest the crux of our problem. When the spies say in verse 33, we look like grasshoppers in our own sight. In other words, even though God is calling them to great things, they see themselves as grasshoppers in a giant's world. A marred vision of self is one of the most heinous crimes we can commit because it robs us of the fullness of God, all God has for us. We sabotage our own success and we will never conquer our external giants until we conquer our internal grasshopper. Our situation does not have to determine our destination. Our destiny is set by God, but we are incapacitated by our fear, fear of our giants, fear of our, an incompetent God, fear of our own inadequacies, fear of failure. And we assume others see us the same way that we see ourselves. Check the text. It is not that the people in Canaan saw them as grasshoppers. It's that they saw themselves as grasshoppers. So this grasshopper complex kept an entire nation in the wilderness for 38 more years. The Israelites took the word of 10 spies over the word of Caleb. The Israelites took the word of 10 spies over the word of God. The Israelites took the word of 10 spies over the evidence of the land. They came back with 
fearful report and a cluster of grapes. What did they say? They said it was a land that devours its inhabitants, the land filled with travails. And yet they stood before Moses holding fruit that bore witness that God is able. We are standing here, having come to a land that should have devoured us, but we still have fruit. Why is it easier to believe the naysayers than to trust the way maker? We have history on this journey. Our story is not the Israelites, but we have our own history with this God. We too are a people God has brought out time and time again. We are those who have survived the Middle Passage and survived the Ocean Block and survived slavery, survived Jim Crow, survived the civil rights era, era, era. And now, yes, we have survived the last four years of a presidency that sought to keep us down. The reason I know we will survive giants is because we've survived them before. Our thinking is too small. Our praise is too small. God tells Moses, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. This is what we need, my friends, in times like these. We need a different spirit. We need a decisive spirit instead of despair. We need a wailing spirit instead of a whimper. We need a courage, courageous spirit instead of cowering. We need a praying spirit instead of majoring in the petty. We need bold and prophetic spirits who are not afraid of the challenges ahead. In times like these, we must remember there will always be giants, but there need not be grasshoppers. Fear not, for we are well able to have all that we have been promised. I believe this is what Dr. King meant when he said, I've been to the mountaintop and God has allowed me to look over and see. I may not get there with you, but we as a people, we will get there. Can you see it? Do you see it? You are not a grasshopper. You are the child of the Most High God. God bless.